Hello, good morning. Welcome to Elevenses with Fran. It's 11 o'clock on a rather grey, damp morning in lockdown, of course. Day 573 of lockdown. Well, I shouldn't joke about that. Maybe one day we will get to day five, 573. Thank you, though, for joining Elevenses with Fran in the hope it provides um, uh, a bit of excitement to your day, which it certainly does to mine. So I'm really grateful for you all to you all for joining me. Um, Monday's short story by Molly Pantadowns was such a big hit among many of you because it really is such an amazing story and I have no doubt that today's story will be too. It's called It's the Reaction and it was written for the New Yorker magazine in 1943 by Molly Pantadowns. It was written the year after the Blitz when London was still recovering from the Blitz of 1941 to 1942 and it's really about how people react to a crisis afterwards, how a crisis impacts people's inner lives and how people often don't react to a crisis in quite the way you might expect. People are complicated, right? And, um, and for some people a crisis, in a strange way, maybe they don't want it to end or they want to emerge differently the other side or, you know, people have all sorts of reactions to a crisis and that's really what Molly Panda Downs is musing on in this story in a very low key, everyday way. Um, you have to listen carefully to really get to the heart, I guess, of what she's saying. But what she is saying is so insightful and memorable, I think. So thank you all so much for joining. Lovely to have you. Um, have you got your cup of tea for Eleven Days with Fran and your piece of cake? I'll ramble while you all get settled, shuffle around. Yeah, finish folding the laundry or shutting some children in a cupboard or <laughs> putting the kettle on. Yeah. All right. Let's begin. It's the Reaction, written in 1943 by Molly Pantadans. Miss Catherine Birch trotted through the lobby of the ministry where she was employed, automatically waved her pass at the doorman and joined the hurrying throng of men and women pouring down the London street towards the bus stops and tube stations. Their haste was contagious. She began to scurry along as though a vitally important evening lay before her. Most of the other female employees of the ministry were girls with hatless manes of long glossy hair hanging around their shoulders or settled up in red or blue snoods. The evening was warm and they raced along bare-legged in their flimsy sandals, their bright cheap coats hanging open. In contrast, Miss Birch seemed to be wearing a great many clothes. Her tailored suit, felt hat, liberty silk scarf, stockings, gloves, chubby rolled umbrella, briefcase and sensible Morocco grained leather bag gave her something of the appearance of a schoolmistress bringing up the rear of a double column of dryads. <laughs> in the tube, the ministry faces thinned out and merged with Greater London. Miss Birch stood in the packed train with her near Morocco purse pressed against the bosom of a stout matron in slacks, while her hat brim brushed the cheek of a young American soldier who was despairingly studying the map of stations over their heads. Her mind went on fretting over that morning's row in the department. She didn't really know how it had happened. She'd felt tired and out of sorts. Someone's stupid inaccuracy had inflamed her and the next thing she knew, she was having it out with Mr Danvers. After the row was over, her hands shook and her voice was weak and quavery. She went to the women's washroom before lunch, wishing that she could lock herself in and have a good howl. Nan Cruddock from the department was there powdering her nose and drawing a modish square mouth over the Victorian bow with, with which nature had inflicted her. You know what I think, Birch, Nan had said kindly as she leaned towards the mirror while alongside her Miss Birch dabbed her cheeks. Know what? It's about time you had some leave. Ask Danvers for some. Go off down to the country and find a cow to look at and for God's sake relax. If you don't, you're for the ministry heebie-jeebies. In plain English, darling, a breakdown. Oh heavens, I must fly! <laughs> and she had rushed off to lunch with the usual mob of people. She was a good-hearted creature though, in spite of her flightiness, and there might even be some common sense in what she said, Miss Bur Birch had reflected later over her solitary sandwich in the canteen. Maybe things had been working up to the morning's flare-up for quite a while. The train filled and emptied, the American boy got out, and Miss Birch leaned against other bosoms before she got to her own station. It was ten minutes' walk from there to Richelieu House, the block of flats where she lived. Three or four of the neighbourhood shops were still open. This district resembled a village 
flowing on, its, on in its muddled 18th century way around the 20th century blocks of steel and concrete which had grown up around it. Miss Birch called in at the little tobacconist newsagent on the corner by the public house and bought some cigarettes. The woman behind the counter said, I've got your players this evening but only loose, no packets, will that do? Miss Birch said that it would. Tucking the chubby umbrella under one arm and digging down for change, she had a sudden sociable impulse to start up a little conversation, to say something which would keep her standing there in the shop, sniffing the smell of frying that was coming out of the back room. She said in a friendly voice, my goodness, how your plant has grown. It's really a beauty now, nodding towards a potted cactus which stood on a table next to a sleeping ginger cat. The woman glanced at it and said, yes, it's doing well, isn't it? Miss Birch picked up her handful of cigarettes and went out. The impulse hadn't come to anything after all. If it had been Nan Croddick now, she knew perfectly well that with half a dozen words, Nan would have leaned over the counter and dragged that woman into her life. With a roll of those round blue eyes, she would have built up something so warm and friendly in no time. It was years now that Miss Birch had been calling in for her cigarettes and never getting much beyond a good evening. Never, that is, except when the blitz was on and everything was different. Miss Birch went on thinking about the Blitz as she walked to her own block and went up in the lift with a Mr Masters who lived on the same floor. Evening, he said pleasantly. Having a lovely bit of weather, aren't we? Lovely, said Miss Birch. Mr Masters let himself into his flat, which was close to the lift, and Miss Birch walked on down the passage, fumbling for her key. Behind the little back doors, she could hear people talking on the telephone, playing their radios, running their bathwater, no doubt all the other tenants on floor K, floor K could hear, if they chose to listen, her footsteps ringing out down the passageway. When she left early in the morning, milk bottles stood outside the doors with newspapers folded on top of them. The neat sealed bottles were like footprints discovered on the floor of an ancient cliff city, a sign that life existed somewhere in this echoing honeycomb. Except for the laughter behind the black doors and the occasional chance encounters in the lift, Miss Birch might have fancied herself quite alone in Richelieu House. She opened the door and crossing to the window, jerked up the blind, which she had prudently lowered before leaving so that the afternoon sun would not take the colour out of the blue divan cover and matching armchair. With all those pretty Chinese cushions, a guest would, a guest would never have suspected that, that the divan was Miss Birch's bed until, seating himself, his knees flew up and hit him on the chin. There was a small gate leg table at which she had her meals sitting upright on a blue chair. Black framed Medici prints, reproductions of old Italian masters, hung in an even row on the distempered cream wall above the bookcase. On the opposite wall were doors leading to a box of a bathroom and a cupboard of a kitchen. Miss Birch remained for a few minutes at the window, still grasping umbrella and briefcase, absently watching the barrage balloons loll lolling over London. They fitted in with her train of thought. She could remember when they didn't look like absurd silver jumbos browsing in space, but when she had thought of them as guardians and felt consoled because they were there. By leaning to the right and twitching the neck curtain aside, she could see down into the street where, five minutes or so earlier, she'd been buying her cigarettes. Seen from above, the jagged space where a bomb had fallen just behind the public house was more noticeable than it was from the road, now that they had cleared the debris away. A landmine had come down too not far away. After that awful night, the woman at the tobacconist had taken Miss Birch into the back parlour to show her the broken windows and the rubble dust lying thick over everything. It's a wonder the whole place didn't come down and that's a fact, she had said, fetching a packet of cigarettes up from under the counter and shoving them at Miss Birch. Here you are, dear. Pop them in your bag. They're short, but if you don't get our smokes to quiet our nerves, we'll all go balmy more than likely. Miss Birch left the window and began taking off her outdoor things, noting that the evening looked settled enough to warrant leaving the chub chubby umbrella at home tomorrow. She hung her suit carefully on a hanger and changed into an old Prince summer dress which she kept for wearing at home. After that, she usually laid the table for supper and when it was over, she would wash up, perhaps glance over the report she brought back with her, mend a pair of stockings and go to bed early with a book. It was her usual way of spending a nice, quiet evening. But this evening, for some reason, she didn't feel like setting it in motion right away. Her, her head ached badly, probably the result of this morning's row. She went into the bathroom and took a couple of aspirins. Then she came back and sat down, the sat down in the armchair by the window. 
The details of the office upset flitted through her mind again, but only for a moment. Footsteps sounded outside in the corridor, a door banged and several people seemed to be laughing and talking together. Miss Birch heard a woman's voice saying emphatically, but if we didn't phone, we'll never get a table. The pint milk bottle at flat six just across the passage must have had a party, which was now proceeding out en masse to find some dinner. At one time, the occupants of flat six had meant rather more than a milk bottle in Miss Birch's life. They were a Mr and Mrs Chalmers, and night after night in the Blitz, they had unrolled their mattresses alongside Miss Birch's mattress in the corridor on floor B. Miss Birch, over a shared thermos of tea, had learned that Mrs Chalmers had married when she was 18 and that Mr Chalmers was allergic to cats. She came to know by heart such small, intimate details as the colour of their pyjamas and the smell of Mrs Chalmers' face cream. And early in the morning, just before the all-clear sounded jubilantly over battered London, Mrs Chalmers would begin to snore. Those nights, terrible as they had been, certainly had had their compensations. It seemed to Miss Birch, looking back, that the inhabitants of Floor K had been one jolly family, recognising each other with a special friendliness among all the other prone tenants of Richelieu House. There had been little Mary Rycroft from Flat 2, a pretty child who looked as though she oughtn't to be out alone in a rainstorm, let alone a blitz. There'd been Mr Masters, strolling down the row of mattresses to ask Miss Birch's help with a tough word in the timed crossword puzzle, or to have a little chat about books. One evening, he had noticed that she was reading Nicholas Nickleby, and the next evening, he had ambled along to say that he had taken her advice and was starting on his tenth reading of Pickwick Papers that very night. You're right, Miss Birch, he had said. There's nothing like the old fellows for keeping one's mind off the fellows up there. And he had nodded towards the racket overhead. Pickwick seems to make him unimportant somehow. They had got really close, like old friends in those talks in the stuffy corridor, listening subconsciously for the warning scream, the sudden hole in the air, the slow glacier of bricks and mortar slipping into the streets below. Now, he was only a man who took off his hat politely in the lift and said, Evening! before fumbling for his key, going in and shutting his front door. Little by little, as normality came back and the passages of Richelieu House were no longer filled with flitting figures carrying torches and pillows, the sense of being neighbours had worn off. Mrs Chalmers, if she and Miss Birch met in the lift, said, Do you know, I've been meaning and meaning to ring you. And at the back of her worried baby eyes and plucked eyebrows, Miss Birch could see the thought forming that one of these days they must really ask the old girl over, fill her up with gin, do something about it. After a while, even that thought disappeared. Mrs Chalmers simply said, hello, and smiled vaguely, as though Miss Birch was someone she had once met at a party. Sitting in the blue armchair, the headache nagging at her, Miss Birch wondered if it wasn't partly her fault. Maybe there was something she could have said or done, some magic password which would have kept that wonderful new friendliness going. If she hadn't frightened them off, Mary Rycroft or Mr Masters might have been dropping in for a chat this evening. She pictured Mr Masters saying in his breezy way, this is something like, as she brought out the beer that she would make a point of keeping in the refrigerator for him. While he drank it, leaning back against the Chinese cushions and flicking his cigarette ash, man-like, over her blue rug, she would tell him about this morning's dust-up with Danvers. Telling it to him, Getting his calm, man's point of view would be a relief far greater than the good howl she'd promised herself all day. He would say, don't worry, my dear girl, it's nothing. And sure enough, it would be nothing. Then he would get up, glass in hand, and wander over to the bookcase. I might have known that you'd be the woman to read William Blake, he would say, cosily. With sudden determination, Miss Birch stood up. She peeped in the mirror, papped a few stray wisps of hair into place, and gave a nervous twitch to the neck of her dress. Then, looking in her bag to make sure that her key was there, she opened the door of her apartment, closed it behind her, and began walking rapidly down the passage towards the lift. Mr Masters' electric bell had a different note had a different note from hers, she noticed. It sounded loud and startled, and Mr Masters also looking startled when he uh, also looked startled when he answered it. Why, come in, he said after the faintest possible pause. Her picture of him had been correct, in so far as he was holding a bottle of beer and an opener in his free hand. He was in his shirt sleeves, and when she walked past him into a frazier version of her own room, she noticed that his tie was lying on the table with the evening paper, some gramophone records and a bowl of ice cubes. 
He made a lunge towards it and she said, oh, please don't bother to get smartened up for me. It's, it's quite warm this evening, isn't it? Feels to me as though we're going to get a bit of thunder, he said. Sit down, won't you? I was just... And he made an embarrassed gesture with the beer bottle or a beer bottle and the opener. Oh, do, do go on, said Miss Birch. I do hope you don't mind my dropping in informally like this. As a matter of fact, I haven't a thing to read and I wondered if you'd very kindly lend me a book. It sounded prim to her own ears, like something she might have written on a memo form in the office. Mr Masters stopped looking nonplussed and set, setting down the beer, gestured to the row of untidy bookshelves against the wall, corresponding to the one where Miss Birch's Medici prints hung. Oh, help yourself, he said. I don't know that you'll find anything much there, but you're welcome. She came forward and made a pretense of looking at the titles. Smiling up at him, she said, you know, I always think of you as a bookish sort of person. Remember our talks about Dickens and Thackeray and Trollope in the old Blitz days? The information that she had thought about him at all brought Mr Masters' surprised expression back again. Oh, those, he said uneasily. Well, thank God that time's a long way back now. Seems like a nightmare, doesn't it? I don't believe we'll ever get him coming over like that again either. Oh, I hope not, said Miss Birch. With lightning cruel clarity, she knew that the visit wasn't going to come off. Nan would have been sitting down within two minutes in the one armchair in the place, crossing her legs above the knee, sharing Mr Barsis's beer, smoking his cigarettes and roaring with laughter at jokes that wouldn't be bookish quips about Trollope and Thackeray. Miss Birch, peering blindly along the shelves, was tongue-tied. She pulled out a volume without even bothering to look at its title and straightened up. May I, may I borrow this? she asked. There didn't seem to be much more to say. Mr Masters became heartier and obviously a good deal relieved as he accompanied her to the door. Any time you want to borrow another, just pop along, he said. Miss Birch's room seemed very still in the evening sunlight as she let herself in. She walked over to the window and stood looking out again at the silver blimps floating aimlessly against the sky. London looked beautiful in this clear light, calm and radiant, as though its sirens would never sound again this side of the grave. Listening to that implacable silence, Miss Birch felt the delayed tears stinging at the back of her throat and nose. It's the reaction, she said aloud, as though she were defending herself to someone. You can't go through month after month of that and not get a reaction sometime. She dropped Mr Masters' book into the chair and became suddenly busy, laying the check cloth on the gate leg table and putting the milk for her cup of Ovaltine on to boil. It was going to be another nice, quiet evening after all, she thought, hopelessly. Again, I find Molly Patterson's dance stories so quietly devastating. She thought hopelessly it's going to be another quiet evening. You know, sometimes in times of crisis, people feel a lot less lonely in a strange way. There's a sense of camaraderie and neighbourliness. Sometimes it's the opposite. Um, I think the point is people react to a crisis in very different ways and react to the ending of a crisis in very different ways. And that's what Molly Pantadown's ca captures so brilliantly, um, writing in the year after the Blitz in 1943. And that's why it feels so immediate. Um, Anyway, thank you so much for joining. Thank you for your lovely comments. Brilliant story. Yes, sense of community. Thank you. Um, thank you. Beautiful. And so apt. I completely agree. So apt. Um, so lovely to have so many of you along. We'll do another Molly Pantadown story on Friday. Um, hope you enjoyed Eleventers with Fran. And I will see you really soon. <laughs>